Hello. So, yet another Western military mention in the Middle East, which are, I would say, well known for their success and general triumph. Uh, this time, it is, of course, the US and the UK bombing Yemen. That is after the dominant Houthi movement there, uh, which rules much of Yemen after a particularly gruesome civil war there, which has gone on for many years, uh, declared that in solidarity with the people of Gaza, they would stage attacks on ships, major shipping routes, Britain and America have gone, well, we will now retaliate with bombing. Um, that is just the general gist of what's happened. Um, it's a little bit more complicated than that, that pricey, but we have the best possible expert to talk us through what the hell is going on, what the hell is going to happen plausibly, and what an alternative is, because that question is going to be asked, what would you do then? What would you do? So we're joined by the brilliant David Waring, who is a lecturer in uh, international relations at the University of Sussex. He wrote a brilliant book called Anglo Arabia, which after this you should all Google and then buy. Um, hi, David. How are you doing? Uh, Yemen, right? So we, you had the Arab Spring in 2011, and in many countries you had revolutions. Yemen was no exception. Um, what happened? I mean, it doesn't just start in 2011 because the Houthi movement predates that. So, who are the Houthis? What happened between 2011 and 2015, basically? So the Houthis are a <clears throat> paramilitary group who um, originate in the northern part of Yemen, the sort of mountainous region in the northern part of Yemen, um, who have this kind of antipathy with the central government, um, who aren't too impressed with the Saudis as well and what they perceive as Saudi interference in Yemen. Um, the Houthis are kind of religious fundamentalists, but also kind of anti-Western, um, there's some religious convergence with Iran as well, not complete, but it's enough for them to build up a kind of relationship with Iran. The central government in Yemen, um, supported by the British and the Americans, so throughout the 2000s, it's like that war and terror period, right? Wages repeated small wars against the Houthis, which achieved nothing. The Houthis are resilient, they withstand this assault. 2011, as you mentioned, these Arab uprisings around the region, including in Yemen. The president, Ali Abdullah Saleh, who's been fighting these small wars against the Houthis, is overthrown, replaced by an interim government. Now, at this point, that president, who's been fighting all these wars with the Houthis, somehow enters into an alliance of convenience with the Houthis, and together they topple the interim government and try and take over. Now, from sort of 2014, 2015, when that happens onwards, um, there's a war between the Houthis and Saleh on the one hand, and pretty much everyone else in Yemen on the other hand. And the interim government is backed by an intervening coalition led by Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, and behind them, the British and Americans who are providing all the arms for the Saudis and the Emirates to use uh, to, fight, to fight this war. Um, the Houthis grow stronger and stronger. The Saudis thought that this whole war could be done and dusted in a few months. Uh, they, in fact, they got stuck in the quagmire for seven years. The Houthis get stronger, they sweep Saleh aside, um, and now they're in command. Where we are now, seven years on, seven or eight years on from that war starting, is that the Houthis have gone from a small paramilitary force in the northern part of Yemen to being effectively a parastate um, controlling the most populous part of Yemen, uh, the north and west, and controlling this bit of coastline, crucially, uh, next to the Red Sea, past which 15 to 20% of global shipping uh, flows. So that, that's a long period of various people bombing the Houthis. Um, that's not new from the Houthis' point of view. And it hasn't made them weaker, put it that way. Um, and that's like, to where we are today. So it's interesting this because a lot of people, Yemen has not been on the radar. Something I've written about over the, over the years, I've been to a Yemeni refugee camp, uh, met children who've gone through <coughs> terrible traumas, uh, drawing pictures of not of, you know, cats and animals, but or kids on swings, but rather of dead bodies in the streets with blood. Really horrible. <coughs> I'm just wondering, I mean, a lot of people think, well, this is a new intervention. You know, this is Britain and America. They're bombing it. But the, the point is that actually the Saudi-led coalition has been armed and backed, not just armed and backed by the US and Britain, but we're more involved than that, aren't we? 
Oh, yeah. I mean, this war between 2015 and 2022, um, which is kind of on a period of unofficial truce now and going through negotiations, but which ran with a sort of full-blown war for seven years. This was one of the worst wars on the face of the planet for a long time. Um, and Britain and America were right in the thick of it in the sense that it wasn't them doing the fighting. It was, as I mentioned, the Saudi-led coalition, um, largely through airstrikes, Saudi airstrikes, supporting forces on the ground, and also a blockade um, on the Houthi-controlled parts of Yemen. So indiscriminate bombing and a blockade of the area in which your enemies are located, which obviously will sound familiar to people who've been following the war in Gaza. It's basically the same kind of collective punishment and attempt to terrorise and coerce and punish the population to get them to turn against the rebel group. Um, it's a kind of form of state terrorism, basically, and you can see this kind of form of violence going right back. Well, the British and the Americans were actively facilitating this. It wasn't just a question of, you know, the, the arms that the Saudis and the Emiratis were using were arms that had been sold to them in a dim and distant past and now happened to be being used in Yemen. It was that Britain and America provided an ongoing supply of bombs, missiles, spare parts and components, maintenance of these jets, um, training of the pilots. The British and the Americans facilitated this aerial bombing campaign. The Americans were providing mid-air refuelling for the jets when the jets were on their you know, bombing runs, these indiscriminate bombing runs. And so Britain and America really were accessories to mass murder, to put it in sort of you know, basic colloquial terms, f throughout this period. They facilitated this whole thing just as they're facilitating what's happening in, in Gaza at the moment. Um, and so, you know, the antipathy that the Houthis have towards the British and the Americans isn't something that comes out of nowhere. It's 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 rooted in it's rooted in that. And of course, I mean, this is a, a, a wider story, but just to note it, Britain was the colonial power in in Aden, in, in the southern part of Yemen, for a long period of time, from the eighteen thirties until the nineteen sixties. And so people in Yemen have long, you know, they have, they have memories just as people in just as we do in this country. They're aware of that history, you know, and so that antipathy goes a long way back and it's it's based on something. I mean, there's been a huge, terrible human consequence, hasn't there? The Saudi-led war on yeah. Yemen, around 300,000, it's believed, have been killed and yeah. 15,000 directly from Saudi-led airstrikes. And I make that point to make a pretty gruesome point that I've made previously, which is, when we look at Gaza, and we're looking often at the moment at the death toll is the violent death toll. It's people directly killed by weapons. But in war, most people don't die as a direct consequence of the violence. They die of other reasons, including the collapse of the medical um, and the healthcare system. And that has happened. Uh, that's That's been one of the big contributing factors, of course, to how many people have died in Yemen. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, that scale of humanitarian uh, catastrophe is something which most people aren't aware of. But, I mean, it is the consequence, isn't it, of a UK and US-backed war this isn't just a new thing that happened this is just yet yeah. more violence which the uk and the us have been involved in yeah i mean that humanitarian crisis as you say it's a really important point that you raised the fact that you know a large amount of people will be killed by indiscriminate bombing um but the damage to health care the damage to the economy the undermining of people's ability to secure the means of survival is actually more dangerous, you know. I mean, th there was a report from Save the Children, I think this was in 2017, so only a couple of years after the war started, they reported that 85,000 infant children, it's not talking about children from the age of zero to 18, I'm talking about children under the age of five, according to Save the Children's estimate, had died as a result of starvation or disease in Yemen, as a result of this man-made humanitarian catastrophe man-made humanitarian catastrophe created in no small part not exclusively because the Houthis had their role as well but in no small part created by our allies and I can't stress this enough with our help with our active assistance and so you know I think people who are who are shocked and unsettled by what they see in Gaza now I think it's really important to stress that this isn't something new and unique. I mean, Western violence often looks like this. You know, we could talk about a whole host of precedents in the colonial era and after that. But just in the last few years, you know, this horrific humanitarian crisis, 
names as by the UN for a period as the world's worst humanitarian crisis, the um, the crisis in Yemen, man-made, as I say. And we're seeing it repeating here. I think what's shocking about Gaza is that in some ways it's almost worse, you know, and as people, both of us, we followed this war in Yemen throughout. It's particularly shocking because I think I just, you know, Yemen struck me as a sort of catastrophe of biblical proportions and yet we've got something that's happening in Gaza now which somehow is even is even worse in terms of you know proportion of people affected in, in the territory proportion of people killed well that's the thing um, isn't it it's, yeah. we, you know, because it's basically because lots of people have tried to play water barrel to me um, with Yemen. People who did not care about Yemen before Gaza yeah. happened. Well, why don't yeah. you say anything about Yemen? Well, we have. We've been talking about Yemen for years, actually. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the this isn't to belittle the horror of Yemen. Yemen has a much, much bigger population than Gaza. Its population is about yeah. 33 million. The pre-war population of Yemen was about 2.2 million, yeah. 2.3 million. In any case, so when we talk about the figures... The horrible figures in Yemen. It's over a much longer period of time. Yeah, there's a there's a much bigger population. Yeah. But what what I was wondering is a lot. You know, one response I could just come up with is to go. Well, does it really matter about UK and US bombing actually? Mm -hmm. Other than you know the who, if there were civilian fatalities, that obviously that is a horrible thing which we need to condemn. But I mean, I mean in a crude, cold, calculating way, which is. If we're all, if Britain is, and the US are already getting the Saudi-led coalition to do their dirty work, and that's failed, the Houthis are still there, thriving on their own terms after so many years. Does it really matter if the British and the US say, "Well, we're doing it directly now. Uh, we're not just it's not just the Saudi-led coalition doing it. We're now doing it directly." In a sense, you could go, "Well, that doesn't, it doesn't really matter. It's just a PR stunt." But is it actually potentially a lot more serious than that? Yeah, it could be. I mean. Look, the Saudis have been trying to get out of this for a while. You know, the war sort of ground to a halt in 2022. There's been an informal truce and there's been negotiations. Um, and getting close to a kind of peace deal until this happened, you know, and what little I've been able to read in the past sort of 24 hours when reports from Yemen is on the ground is this kind of, wow, we lived through that and we thought we were getting to peace and now here we are again. Um, it, you know, it's worth saying that if you can't defeat the Houthis with 20 years of bombing by various different people, it's difficult to see how a few extra missiles last night is going gonna, is gonna to change much. I don't see the Houthis being deterred particularly from, from the disruption they were causing in the Red Sea. Um, and these, these airstrikes, you know, they, they can have an effect in the sense that you know, it feeds this escalatory dynamic, right? I mean, the British and the Americans appear to seriously believe that they can deter the Houthis through, you know, a night of direct airstrikes on Yemen. It strikes me as incredibly unlikely. The Houthis look confident to me. They've come out of seven years of war stronger than ever. You know, they fought off a regional military power backed by the world's leading military powers. Um, they looked, extreme, they looked extremely confident and ready for more. You know, they've been able to rally a lot of support to their side within Yemen, seemingly, certainly in the wider uh, Middle East. They've been able to present themselves as, you know, the one, one of the few serious military forces that are pushing back against Israel. Um, I'm sure they welcome this. They certainly appear to welcome this. And the danger is for the, for the region and for the world that they don't do what the British and the Americans do, which is take the hint and stop, but rather they carry on. They carry out another air, a strike on shipping, maybe even on British and American shipping. And at that point, what do the British and the Americans do? Because the dangerous escalatory logic is that you take certain measures expecting your opponent to then back down, but your opponent doesn't back down. And then your credibility is at stake. You've invested your credibility in your apparent ability to to deter your enemy when your enemy isn't deterred you have to up the ante and then they from the same point of view also up the ante and then where are we i mean the big danger is now you have a regional conflagration which doesn't just disrupt shipping in the red sea but ends up spreading to the persian gulf which is the artery through which a huge proportion of the world's oil flows and then you've got a huge inflationary shock put, put aside the carnage that we'll see in the Middle East beyond even what I see now. For the rest of the world, you're going to have a huge inflationary shock. 
that's going to impact on politics in the West. If you're Joe Biden, um, not only are you losing support because from certain groups because of what you're doing in Gaza, but you're going to start losing support um, because of your, you know, you'll be blamed for your stewardship of the economy if inflation goes back up. And then you end up with Donald Trump in the White House. So the thing about these dynamics is their impacts can spread around the world in all these unpredictable ways. And the idea that chucking a few missiles at the problem is a prudent, sensible, serious approach is exactly wrong. What we need is de-escalation in this moment, serious diplomacy to de-escalate, because this is getting really out of hand now. It's really concerning. Yeah, I'm just a couple of the questions. I mean, also, firstly, about also what this is going to do in terms of Houthi support. I mean, we've seen a huge rally in the Yemeni capital, Sana, of about a million people. Um, that's huge. I mean, as I said, the population is about 32.3 million. I mean, admittedly, not the entire population is ruled by the Houthis, but as you said, the bulk. Um, so it's a huge number of people. I mean, I don't know. Some might say, well, you know, it's an authoritarian movement and how do they mobilise people? I don't know. But what's your um, thoughts on what that means? And also because often there's this presentation of the Houthis is they're just basically an Iranian proxy and they are backed by Iran. They are, they have their weapons provided by Iran, that kind of thing. But they, they do have their own base, clearly, in Yemen that is authentic. So will this just basically, for the Houthis, it's, it will help mobilise and present themselves as we are, you know, while most of the Arab states are just standing by while Gaza is being slaughtered, whatever the actual reality of what the Houthis are actually doing, but that's how they'll present themselves, won't they? And that's how they'll yeah. support yeah 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 as i say just this this strengthens them this is what they're looking for um you know i i won't pretend that de-escalating this is going to be easy you know um it will be hard and it will involve diplomacy and the the tricky thing is as you rightly say the houthis are not just puppets or proxies of iran you know that's a the simplistic way that a lot of mainstream coverage looks at these things in the Middle East, this, you know, this actor is a proxy of Iran, that actor is a proxy of Iran. Yeah, like, the chess, the chess yeah, 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 exactly. That that kind of, you know, and, and it can boil things down, you know, to, 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 to a really simplistic degree. The Houthis do have a really productive, from their point of view, um, relationship with Iran, they've really, which they've really benefited from. But they also have, as you've indicated, their own interest, their own agency. Apparently, in 2015, the, the Iranians didn't want the Houthis to go down and seize the capital. They they argued against that, but the Houthis did it anyway. So it gives you a sense of the degree of independence they have. But nevertheless, if there's going to be the escalatory diplomacy, and I really hope the Americans cotton on to the fact that they've got nowhere else to go with their current approach and they're going to have to do something else. If there really is de-escalatory diplomacy, which has to include Iran, then it's not going to be a case of, well, we'll just do a deal with the Iranians formally or informally, and then the Iranians will yank the hoof his chain and that will be it. The Iranians will have to exert what influence they can over the Houthis, but you know, and we, we would have to hope that that succeeds. But certainly, that approach has got a far more is far more promising, um, far more likely to have some success than, as I say, just throwing some missiles at the problem, which is a kind of you know, it's a usual case of military action. It's a case of looking serious rather than actually being serious. Yeah, I mean, on that, because the question is always thrown at us is, well, what would you do then? And at this point, I find that quite insulting because they said that about Afghanistan and look what happened. They said that about Iraq, and look what happened. They said that about Libya, look what happened. I think at this point, I'd have some introspection if I were these people, and yet they walk from crime scene to crime scene, splattered with more and more blood, still presented as learned elder statesmen who we should all listen to on their wisdom or foreign policy, while were the crazy extremists who were proven wrong in the worst possible way over and over again. But they'll still say it, what would you do? And the point they would make here is, look, whatever you think about how we got here, these are the shipping lanes. The global economy does depend on it. We have to take action. That's just the way the world works. We, Our, our local populations would expect us to when they suddenly see price rising. They work out why, and it's because mm -hmm. we need to take action. So I suppose the argument then to these people, I mean, the, the obvious answer would be <laughs> if you stop, stop enabling a massacre in Gaza, whatever the Houthis and just happen to be here. Yeah. Clearly, but I mean, just in terms of how we get out of this, because that is the Houthi demand. Yeah. And, 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 and you know, again, just on that, you know, I think a lot of the world, because there's such a West-centric view of looking at this, 
a lot of the world is looking at the West at the moment, and a lot of them did not have illusions in Western moral authority in the first place, for good reason. Um, but now they're seeing, for most of the Western world, they, they say, oh, I see. So the West will take shipping lanes seriously, but not living human beings seriously. They'll intervene to stop saying the shipping lanes. They won't intervene to save Palestinian citizens. So I'm just wondering about what you think about, you know, that, that alter, you know, in terms of the alternatives and why it's shouted down and what we do instead. Yeah, yeah. I mean, before I was talking to you, I had an interview on Times Radio with um, Ruth Davidson. Lucky you. Yeah, that was great. Um, and, you know, she was giving me that line, which was, you know, you have to do something, don't you? And you do have to do something. But you have to do something that works, you know. Um, and... So, so, you know, just throwing more missiles at the problem doesn't work. I mean, you know, that, that proposition has been tested, you know. Not that I don't necessarily want to analyse this purely from the West point of view and what works for the West. But, you know, in, in, I think, you know, people at home watching this are going to be in their arguments with family and friends and colleagues and what have you are going to hear, well, what would you do? And the, the answer to that is, you know, if we're thinking about what's happening in, in in the Red Sea and how inflation is going to affect all of us, you know, I I don't want more inflation any more than anyone else. It's like it's painful for all of us. This stuff. The best way to get past that is to de-escalate the conflict through diplomacy. Gaza is is at the heart of this. I think an increasing number of people understand that there has to be a ceasefire in Gaza. Um, Pure, you know, above all because of the, the horrible effect on the Palestinians. Above all because we're, you know, we're watching the world's first live streamed genocide. And in addition to that, because it's dragging the whole region into what could be a truly awful conflict. And in addition to that, because it's dragging the world into a crisis, which um, you know will impact on the global economy seriously and which could in turn have loads of knock-on effects in american politics for example which you know we, we none of us in the world want to need a fascist in the white house but that's the way it's going in part because of because of this and i cannot stress enough again you know we've seen western military action time and time again not have not not reach the goals that the perpetrators set themselves it's not only that it's criminal these various interventions in Iraq and Afghanistan and, you know, the backing of the Saudis in Yemen, the backing of Israel in Gaza. It, it's the worst thing is that it's criminal, but it's also true that, you know, they don't even get the results they're looking for. Yeah. You know, when have they won, when, when have they won on their own terms? You know, so all, all these things are important to, to, to bear in mind. If we want this Red Sea crisis to stop and if we want to avoid the return of really high inflation, then we'll need to push for, we need to push for diplomacy. And above all, that means a ceasefire in Gaza, not just for the, you know, above all for the, for, for the sake of the people in Gaza, but for the rest of us as well, because this is getting worse and worse. Which is why I think reframing this is we said that, the onslaught against Gaza would lead to a human catastrophe. It has. And we also said it risked a major regional escalation. It has. Yeah. And the answer to that isn't to go, well, we'll just up the ante with the regional escalation. It's to deal with what we warned about, the root of the problem, the onslaught against Gaza, which will deal with two things, which is the human catastrophe, which is man-made, and the regional escalation. Just finally, and then on that kind of pity finale, do you fear this actually threatens catastrophe? And I don't just mean that it's the twofold. It's the catastrophe for people in Yemen who've suffered so much, as we said, mm. and the catastrophe for the world unless there is a major de-escalation. Yeah, yeah, I, I do. And, you know, like, I don't think a region, a full-blown regional war involving, you know, Iran and the UK and the US fighting directly with Iran is likely um i don't think you can completely rule it out because the escalate and escalation can take you to all sorts of places um but you know some risks they don't have to be probable for you to take them really seriously you know it may be a something that's not so likely but would be so absolutely catastrophic if it happened that you have to take it very seriously and even if it's not something quite that bad 
already this disruption is having an effect on the oil price. It's disrupting uh, car production in Germany. Um, increasingly, the more this disruption goes on in the Red Sea, which could get much, much worse, I would expect it to get much, much worse um, if there's not a change of course, then yeah, that can have a serious effect. That can stop inflation coming down if we're talking about the effect on, on the wider world. Um, and if we go back to Gaza, you know, I mean, it seems to me that Netanyahu will be loving this as well. The longer this war goes on, the, the big thing this war has achieved, apart from lots of dead people, is to keep Netanyahu in, in power. You know, it seems to me at least he, I don't know about the rest of the regime, but at least he, want an escalation, you know. They want this. They want all of this in the realm of violence. The minute it goes to the realm of diplomacy and the, and the war stops, then there's a reckoning with Netanyahu domestically. So, you know, there were all these all these factors pushing it. You know, pushing the escalatory dynamic. And um, you know, we in British civil society and around the world, for all sorts of reasons, for the sake of the people of Palestine, for the sake of the people of Yemen, for the sake of the rest of the world, in various different ways really need to push for a de-escalation, for a ceasefire in Gaza, but a wider de-escalation as well. David, fantastic stuff. We've, I think, a real masterclass there. I think we've covered that in, in the detail that it required. Um, so make sure you get this. Sp spread the word, everyone. We need to make sure people are aware that this does actually threaten disaster. It threatens a real, real massive escalation with potentially catastrophic uh, consequences. So do like and subscribe and share the video. But Dave, thank you so, so much for joining us. Thank you.